Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Nate Kazmarek. I help uh, direct the practice groups here for the Federal Society. We have a great panel and an important topic, so let's get started. Uh, welcome to this special session sponsored by the practice groups titled uh, Second Amendment, Will the Supreme Court Adhere to Bruin and Originalism in Rahimi and Beyond? Uh, the vast majority of the panels and the content this weekend are the result of our FedSoc leadership volunteering their time and formidable expertise to support our mission, and we're grateful to each of them. If you'd like to get more involved with the practice groups and help drive our programs and content, I'd be, like, uh, I'd be delighted to talk to you. So please don't uh, hesitate to catch me in the halls or shoot me an email so we can talk after the conference. Before I turn things over to Judge Van Dyke, I also wanted to briefly take a moment to thank the, the Federal Society staff who have helped to put this uh, NLC together. Uh, please join me in thanking my hardworking colleagues. Turning to our moderator, I was instructed by him to keep it very short. Uh, all of the bios for, our pan for him and our panelists have been provided to you already, and they are available uh, on our website. Judge Lawrence Van Dyke serves as a circuit judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Prior to that, he had a very distinguished legal career, which he forbade me to mention. So I'll just say that uh, to know him even a little or to speak to his family or his, to, or his clerks is to understand immediately his deep warmth, generosity, and his brilliance. Please welcome our panel. Right, well, thank you, Nate, and thank you very much to the Federal Society for setting up an amazing panel with amazing panelists um, on a great topic, and it's great to see so many people interested in it. I see that, uh, like, like my court, the uh, Federal Society has Judge Bea sitting here right in front, so that uh, my colleague Judge Bea, so that assuming that things will go off the rails and he'll have to step in and like uh, put, put some semblance of order back in here. But uh, um, th this morning we have uh, uh, David Thompson and Mark Smith with us. Before we start, we had a third panelist, but unfortunately uh, he fell, uh, fell ill and so was not able to join us. But uh, Bill Merkel, professor at Charleston School of Law, um, is not able to be with us this morning, but uh, David Thompson is going to channel his best uh, inner professor and, uh, and be able to try to give us his perspective on that this morning. But David's going to lead us off. David is a managing partner at Cooper & Kirk. He's argued before the United States Supreme Court on several occasions and each of the 13 federal courts of appeals. He's litigated in over 30 district courts around the country as well as before many state courts, and he's currently litigating dozens of Second Amendment cases. He's a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law School. And then after David uh, speaks this morning, then he's going to be followed by Mark Smith. Mark Smith is a constitutional attorney and host of the Four Boxes Diner Second Amendment channel, whose videos on YouTube have been viewed 23 million times. Mark is a visiting fellow with Oxford University's Department of Pharmacology. He's also a senior fellow with the Alvin Maria School of Law. He's a New York Times bestselling author who frequently appears on Fox News. His most recent books include Disarmed, and also First They Came for the Gun Owners, and Duped. He's published in many law reviews, including the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy. So what we're going to do this morning is David's going to lead us off, and then Mark's going to speak, and then David's going to uh, give some comments, maybe even ask a question or two about um, you know, Mark, and we'll just go back and forth, and then we'll obviously have some time for questions and answers once that's all finished. Thank you very much. David? Well, well thank you, Judge, and it's a pleasure to be uh, on this panel with both Judge Van Dyke, who's a hero to anyone who cares about the Second Amendment, and Mark Smith, whose YouTube channel is now must-see TV for anyone who cares about the Second Amendment. Um, I want to talk about Rahimi. This week, the United States Supreme Court heard oral argument in that case. It's a case 
that's been rushed to the United States Supreme Court by Merrick Garland with the intention of doing maximum damage to the Second Amendment. And the case has the worst facts imaginable. Here are the allegations. In 2019, the defendant, Zaki Rahimi, bashed his girlfriend's head into the dashboard of their car. And when someone tried to intervene and protect his girlfriend, he whipped out a gun and started shooting it in the air to ward off any intervention. Rahimi then allegedly engaged <clears throat> in a <clears throat> uh, five shooting sprees over the coming months. I'll just share with you the details of one of them. He was at a what's a burger uh, with one of his buddies and um, his friend's credit card was denied. And uh, like any rational person, he whipped out his gun and started shooting it into the ceiling. Not once, but on multiple occasions. I guess once wasn't enough to you know, show his displeasure with Visa. In any event, <laughs> this is the man that we're dealing with. And, um, you know, investigators then started looking into this and they found that a protective order had been entered after the bashing the girlfriend's head into the dashboard and that he was in violation of 18 U.S.C. 922 G8. And that's the statute that he's challenging here. Now, what are we to do? with someone like Mr. Rahimi, the rather obvious answer is lock him up and throw away the key forever. That way he'll never have a gun ever again, okay? But for whatever reason, the district attorney in Texas is slow walking this case. There are charges that are pending. Uh, they would lead to Mr. Rahimi being in prison for 60 to 70 years, but they are in a slow boat. And so that has permitted uh, Rahimi and his public defendant lawyer to come forward and challenge 922 G8. So let's uh, start with the Bruin methodology. We start with the text. It's really not complicated. The operative clause, of course, as you all know, says the right of the people to keep and bear arms arms shall not be infringed. Can we just pause a moment? If we were all collectively to sit around a table and try to come up with words that would capture an enduring, robust a right to self-defense, could we really have done any better? I mean, they just said it. It's so crystal clear. And the government, not surprisingly, does not make any reference to the actual text in their arguments. Instead, and the reason is, of course, Rahimi was keeping, that is possessing, a handgun, which is an arm. And so the only possible argument for excluding him from the text is the meaning of the term people, the people. But that's been addressed in the Heller decision. Justice Scalia wrote, in all six other provisions of the Constitution that mention the people, the term unambiguously refers to all members of the political community, not an unspecified subset. As we said in United States versus Verdugo, the people refers to a class of persons who are part of a national community who have otherwise developed sufficient connection with this country to be considered part of that community. And we know from the First Amendment, and Lord knows we know from the Fourth Amendment, that criminals have First and Fourth Amendment rights. That's why we have an exclusionary rule. Um, and so there's a... <clears throat> It's no wonder, given the meaning of the term the people, that the Solicitor General does not quote the text. Now, the Solicitor General instead has a gloss on the text that she repeated like a mantra over and over again, saying it's responsible, law-abiding people who have a right to keep and bear arms. Now, there's a litany of problems with this approach. The first is she's quoting from Heller and Bruin, but as Justice Barrett made clear this week, that was a descriptive, it's not even dicta in Heller and Bruin. Nobody was uh, challenging that uh, Heller and Bruin were law-abiding citizens. It was rather just simply a description of the fact that they were law-abiding citizens. And there are very good reasons why the Second Amendment test should not be responsibility. Uh, as the Chief Justice made clear in his questionings, he said, well, if somebody goes 30 miles an hour in a 25 mile an hour speed zone, are they responsible? And what about somebody, the Chief Justice said, who fails to, re uh, to recycle? And you can imagine <laughs> a variety of left-wing jurisdictions saying, are you a vegetarian? How many times do you do yoga? How many pronouns do you have? I mean, 
You know, there are all sorts of metrics that the government could use uh, to limit the Second Amendment. That's not the system the founders had. And so to her credit, the Solicitor General read the room, realized that wasn't going anywhere. And she said, well, what I mean by responsible, I mean is dangerousness. Well, last time I checked, those aren't really synonyms, but in any event, she, she fell back and she'd kind of called out on her sleight of hand. Now, I do want to, to note that even though, as she was saying, well, responsible means dangerous, she also said that with respect to law-abiding, that doesn't include dangerous. And she was holding out the possibility that anyone who commits a felony can be stripped of their Second Amendment rights forever throw a pile of dirt in a wetland, lose your Second Amendment rights. Uh, make an improper tax deduction, no Second Amendment rights. Dabble in a little Martha Stewart insider trading, no Second Amendment rights. <laughs> You know, and so uh, we have another case. We call it at Cooper and Kirk the Jean Valjean case. It's a man who stole a loaf of bread 40 years ago to feed his family. And uh, the Third Circuit has, in an en banc decision, an excellent decision, has just struck down that statute uh, as applied to Mr. Range. And Justice Barrett made reference to that case. And not surprisingly, Merrick Garland put that one on a slow boat and, you know, extended the time for this cert petition sped up Rahimi so that Rahimi will be in front of the court, not Jean Valjean. And so we may be back uh, next year at the convention talking about the range case. But going back to Rahimi, the bottom line is that Rahimi is covered by the text. So under Bruin, now we turn to history. And the burden, this is important, the burden shifts to the government. The government must come up with an appropriate analog to justify departing from the text. The basic idea is simple. The text governs, but if at the time of the founding the text was understood not to, to, to have some sort of limitation, then that limitation still applies. Now the Department of Justice has a little bit of difficulty understanding the consequences of a burden shift because they articulated in their briefs, and again uh, this week at oral argument, that even if there's no regulation, they should still win. Well, that's not the way it works. Uh, and Bruin confirmed this obvious point. Bruin said, quote, when a challenged regulation addresses a general societal problem that has persisted since the 18th century, the lack of a distinctly similar historical regulation addressing that problem is relevant evidence that the challenged regulation is inconsistent with the Second Amendment. So in other words, they've got the burden, and if they don't have anything, they lose. Now, here are a few other methodological points that are relevant in Rahimi. One is, what's the right time period. Can you look you know, to 1900 uh, to dive in the public meaning of the Second Amendment? No, you can't. Uh, and we're lucky to have Mark Smith here who has written the definitive takedown of the left's efforts to try to first say, well, we should really look at Reconstruction and then we should extend that you know, decades beyond to understand and that's all inappropriate. Um, another methodological point is the government is trying to say, well, we shouldn't confine ourselves to looking at the history of firearms regulation. Uh, the, the, the government obviously wants to try to get away from looking at the history of firearms regulation because there was very little you know, uh, firearms regulation that really curtailed in significant, meaningful, and pernicious ways the text of the Constitution at the time of the founding. And so the government knows that if the focus is on the history of regulation of firearms, they're going to lose most of their defenses of their crazy gun control control laws. And so what the government says is, well, look, when we're uh, looking at other constitutional sources, we don't blind ourselves to Blackstone. We don't blind ourselves to Joseph Story's commentaries. We don't blind ourselves to the Federalist Papers. And of course, they're right. Second Amendment uh, uh, judges, should, uh, judges looking at this shouldn't blind themselves to that here either, but they should look at those sources only insofar as they relate to firearms regulation. Here again, Bruin made this clear, quote, the government must demonstrate that the regulation is consistent with this nation's historical tradition of firearm regulation only if a firearm regulation is consistent with this nation's historical tradition, may a court conclude that the individual's conduct falls outside the Second Amendment's unqualified command. 
Okay, now the analogs also have to match, uh, match the how and the why of the statute that's being challenged. What Bruin meant by, with respect to the why, is that the purpose of the law has to be the same. And with respect to the how, the means of obtaining that purpose has to be the same. And they don't have to be identical twins, but they do need to be <clears throat> distinctly similar. So what sort of analogs does the government have? Well, the government first starts by trying to sort of weasel out of having to find analogs by saying uh, that uh, domestic violence, they tell us, really wasn't seen as a problem at the time of the founding. And so it's hardly surprising that there wasn't regulation about domestic violence. This is wrong in every respect. We were founded as a Judeo-Christian country. And, I, and do you think Car Cotton Mather would have thought that it was okay to beat your wife? Do you think he thought, oh yeah, love your neighbor as yourself, except if it's your wife, and then you can beat her up as much as you want? Well, that's not what he said. He condemned it from the pulpit, from pulpit after pulpit after pulpit across the country at the time of the founding, domestic abuse was condemned. Those who engaged in it were condemned as beasts, and it wasn't just at the pulpit. The law also condemned these individuals, and Blackstone makes that very clear as well. So the premise of the government's argument that somehow at the time of the founding, uh, spousal abuse was permitted is wrong, uh, factually. So what does the Solicitor General rely on? Well, there are two sources of analogs. The first is the surety system. And for those of you who don't tuck Blackstone under your pillow at night, let me describe to you what the surety system was. Um, there were a variety of different surety systems, but the one that I want to focus on was basically someone could come forward, let's say a wife, and say, my husband is a danger to me. And then a judge would engage in an individualized finding of whether there was a credible threat and credible evidence as to whether that was true. And if so, the person who was accused could still keep a firearm, could keep and possess it, provided that they could find two people in the community who would come and vouch for them and who would put up money uh, that would be lost if there was any subsequent misbehavior. And if uh, two people wouldn't come forward, the person went to prison. And that was the system they had. Um, and uh, it was really a very clever system because it relied on the wisdom of judges who had to make this individualized finding. And it also reminded on, uh, you know, depended on someone standing in the community. Does anyone think that Adam Lanza or Jared Loeffner would be able to find multiple members of the community to come forward and say, yeah, this nut job can be trusted with a gun? I don't think so. Um, and so, you know, if you posted the sureties, you just had to behave. Um, and if you didn't, you went to prison. And and so that was one of the primaries. It wasn't the only way, but it was one of the primary ways that a domestic abuse was uh, dealt with at the time of the founding. And it was a system of preventative justice. Uh, but it was a system of preventative justice that did depend upon an individualized finding of dangerousness. Now, uh, if we translate that into Bruin and look at, well, how does that match up to the how and the why, the why is the same. The purpose is the same, as this is a uh, person who's uh, been determined to be a, a highly dangerous, credible threat of physical violence, but the means was very different, right? You had members of the community who could come in and vouch for the person, and the person could potentially continue to keep and possess a firearm. Um, so the point is that the Second Amendment clearly allows for a system of preventative justice, um, uh, one that aims at uh, disarming people like Rahimi. Um, I doubt there are two people who would have been willing to come forward. Maybe that guy whose credit card didn't work would have scrounged together a few bucks, but you know, I, I, it's, it's very likely he would not be able to meet a modern day surety system and, and nothing would preclude a state from having a modern day surety system. Now the second, but, but the means is very different and so the government really should not get credit for the surety system as an analog. Now, the second analog the government points to is an affray. And uh, an affray is conduct that's been committed to the terror of the public. So someone who's a drunken rioter has committed an affray. Someone who's beaten somebody else up has committed an affray. Someone who's gone to a burger joint and shot a gun into the roof has committed an affray. Um, the most important thing to know about the affray is it is a criminal 
offense. And as such, there would be the full panoply of protections, criminal law protections, the right to a trial by jury, the right to a high standard of proof. And 922G, with its focus on domestic uh, restraining orders, domestic violence restraining orders, does not have those protections. Rahimi didn't have a lawyer, and he really had the deck stacked against him uh, when he was considering signing the protective order, because if he had not, he would have had to pay all the attorney's fees associated with this. And for someone who's really dangerous, you know, that doesn't matter, so what? You know, he had to sign the paper. But there'll be tens of thousands of Americans who can't face that sort of crippling financial liability, and will just go ahead and sign whatever is in the, put in front of them, um, and, and that's very pernicious. And so here again, we have a match as to the purpose, the so-called why, but we don't have a match as to the means, uh, uh, you know, is, is what has been argued, and I think there's considerable force to that. Uh, I tend to think, based on the arguments and, and the questioning uh, at, at oral argument, the court will find uh, that the sureties and the affrays are proper analogs. Um, and the court may well emphasize that Rahimi didn't even contest the individualized findings. Um, and, and so that may be the dispositive point. There are other analogs that at least the amici have pointed to. They have pointed to the fact uh, that uh, slaves were disarmed and Native Americans were disarmed at the time of the founding. Uh, the problem, as even the Solicitor General recognizes, is they were not understood to be part of the people. Moreover, the why behind those laws was there was a fear of armed insurrection, and that's obviously very far afield from the why behind 922 G8. Now you might be thinking, uh, doesn't Rahimi have any due process rights? And he does, but unfortunately he never raised that point. You might be thinking, how can the federal government, uh, even under Wickard versus Filborn, have the authority to be regulating something like this under the Commerce Clause? That's an interesting question, and it's one he didn't raise below, so the court's not going to have the opportunity uh, to look at this. Now, uh, as was made reference to at the beginning, our, our fellow panelist um, is not here, and so we want to try to give due regard uh, to uh, the other arguments. Uh, that might be made on the other side of all this. And so I think the best way to do that is to take a selection of quotes uh, from the oral argument this week. And lest you think that I'm caricaturing anyone, these are all direct quotes uh, from the justices. Let's start at random with Justice Jackson. Okay, Justice Jackson said, quote, I'm trying to understand whether we can really be analyzing this consistent with the Bruin test at the level of generality of dangerousness. I wonder whether we need to be taking into account how historically domestic violence in particular was treated so that if we had evidence that you know, men who engaged in domestic violence were actually perceived not as dangerous from the standpoint of disarmament, what would we do in that situation? Well, answer. Uh, is that, you know, physical violence, we may have learned how to split the atoms in 1791, but physical violence hasn't changed. If somebody hits you in the head in 1791, it hurts just as much if they hit you in the head today. It was perceived as violent and dangerous then, and it is violent and dangerous now. It was a scourge then and now, and so the premise of her question is wrong. Now, her next, uh, next another question she had was, quote, but you seem to be suggesting that we're, what we're looking for is reconstruction error sources. I suppose that applied to the regulation of white Protestant men related to domestic violence. I, this is wrong at every conceivable level. Uh, first of all, we're not looking to the reconstruction. Mark Smith will address that. It's 1791. That's true for the states, but I mean, this is a federal statute. Under what conceivable rationale would we be looking to reconstruction, uh, you know, with respect to the federal government? The second is that there's zero reason we would confine our analysis just the way white, Protestant men were regulated for domestic violence. All history relating to the regulation of firearms is relevant and uh, we a, a, and must be addressed under the Bruin methodology. Uh, Justice Jackson also said earlier, I'm trying to understand if there's a flaw in the history and traditions kind of framework to the extent that when we're looking at history and tradition, we're not considering the history and tradition of all people, but only some of the people as per the government's articulation of the test. And of course that's wrong because we're looking at 
whoever the people were, were looking at how were they regulated. But it's not, we're not, you know, she, she, to the extent she's saying, well, why isn't the regulation of slaves relevant? It, it can be relevant. In Bruin, it was very relevant. Because in Bruin, the left was trying to pretend that there was a nationwide ban on carriage, that every uh, founder, George Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, that they were all habitual felons who were carrying in violation of this unseen prohibition on carriage. And there were lots of reasons that was wrong and a lie, uh, but, uh, but one of the reasons was the slave laws, because there, was a speci there were specific statutes banning slaves from carrying firearms. Why would you need that if everyone understood, as they claimed, uh, that there was a ban on carriage for everyone? So um, those laws can be relevant, but uh, Justice Jackson simply wrong in terms terms of saying that uh, somehow we're going to ignore uh, certain parts of history. Uh, now her next question. Okay, but let's say I'm a legislator today in Maine, for example, and I'm very concerned about what has happened in that community, and my people, the constituents, are asking me to do something. Do you read Bruin as, as step one being going to the archives and having to determine whether or not there's some sort of historical analog for the kinds of legislation I'm considering? Answer, you don't have to do that. You could simply honor the text. That would be fine if you're a legislator in Maine. You don't have to go to the archives at all. Now, it might be too hard you know, for someone to have to actually go read the text, I suppose. Maybe that would be the rejoinder, but I don't, I don't think that's very persuasive. In any event, the point is, yes, if you're going to try to chip or chip away and erode and denigrate the text of the United States Constitution, yes, you have to do the work of Googling and looking to see what is the scholarship available uh, with respect to proper historical analogs. She asks, what's the justification for this? The text, that's the, that's the justification uh, for this limitation on the legislatures. Now we turn to Justice Sotomayor, she said, uh, just to be clear, none of the situations that Justice Alito is pointing to are the facts of this case. Are they? Oh, that's a gotcha. Uh, <laughs> General Prelegar, no, they're hypotheticals. And uh, Justice Sotomayor, or, and they're not the facts of this statute. I didn't know that statutes had facts, so I can't really answer that question. Okay, now, so let's um, step back for a moment and, and, and just sort of take cognizance of where we are in all of this. I mean, any just society will have a mechanism to disarm dangerous people, and it will have a system to disarm those who have misbehaved in the past, and the founders had that. It was the affray system. And it will have the ability to disarm those who have been found to, uh, on an individualized judicial determination, to be a threat. Uh, and that's a preventative justice system that the surety system had. And the bottom line is that the founders created a just society. It was a society that honored the right to self-defense, but it was also a system that had the means to ensure that those who are truly dangerous, as evidenced by an individualized judicial finding of dangerousness, could be disarmed. Now the old adage is that bad facts make bad law, and we're going to find out pretty soon about that. Uh, the court is likely, I believe, to rule against Rahimi, and I hope if they do so, they will point out that he did not raise any due process objections, he did not raise any Commerce Clause objections, he did not raise a challenge to C2, the part of the statute that doesn't require a finding of dangerousness, and he didn't even contest the findings that were embedded in the protective order against him about, you know, his prior crime spree. Um, so I, I think those would all be limiting principles for the decision that we're likely to say. Let me just say the stakes are really high here. The Second Amendment is the area of constitutional law that has is the most free of debris and clutter of bad precedents that we have. And so if we can't make originalism work in the Second Amendment, it's a very bad harbinger for those who want to see originalism restored to the entire Constitution. The good news is that the Supreme Court has articulated a highly functional, highly rational, highly efficacious test with Bruin, and I'm confident that they're going to stick to it and not throw it in the trash. Thank you.
Thank you for that introduction, uh, Judge Van Dyke, and uh, always a pleasure to be in attendance with David Thompson of the law firm Cooper & Kirk, one of the premier Second Amendment law firms in America. Uh, before I begin, I just want to uh, give a moment of honor in light of the fact that today's Veterans Day, so I want to honor all veterans, including my late parents, both of whom were veterans of World War II. I also want to give a moment of honor, of course, to those that participated in the militia, going back to the founding of our country, you know, the battles of Kings Mountain, the Battle of Bennington, the Battle of Saratoga, of course, the Battle of uh, the Green at Lexington and Concord. And given the topic is today, the Second Amendment, I want us to, of course, remind everyone that when the British left Boston to march on Lexington and Concord, they were not there to enforce the taxes. They were there to steal the Patriots' guns. So we must always keep that in mind with that history uh, when we talk about the Second Amendment and where it comes from. The other thing is, when I found out from the Federalist Society that uh, Judge Van Dyke was going to be the moderator, I was actually greatly concerned because, as you know, Judge Van Dyke is a, a judge on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. And that concerns me to this very moment because I'm concerned that everything I'm about to say here is going to be unbonked and reversed by Judge Van Dyke's colleagues. But I'm hopeful if that happens, Judge Van Dyke will write a powerful dissent. <laughs> Okay, so since Bruin was decided in June of 2022, we have seen a huge amount of Second Amendment litigation. Arguably, this is the most fruitful and busy area of constitutional law in America today. And with all due respect to the many federal judges in this audience and Judge Van Dyke, unfortunately, the inferior courts as we understand them under Article Three of the U.S. Constitution throughout this country, many of whom unfortunately have not gotten the Heller-Bruin methodology correct, and I want to talk about some of those errors and how to correct them in my speech today. And just as a reminder, there's two sets of sort of litigations going on. Some of the challenges involving the Second Amendment are to laws that were on the books before the Bruin decision in June of 2022, and they are being challenged. And then you have a whole spate of other types of litigations that arose from the hissy fits thrown by blue states controlled by the Democrats that just basically said, we want to thumb our nose at the U.S. Supreme Court and the Second Amendment, and we're going to engage in a type of massive resistance to our civil rights, to our constitutional rights that we haven't seen since the 1950s with certain states decide to fight the effort of civil rights workers to desegregate the South. That is what we are seeing in the Second Amendment context in some of these blue states. And there is a lot of litigation arising from those laws that have been passed in a rush trying to just punish gun owners for exercising their constitutional rights and again engage in massive resistance to this Supreme Court. So I want to do two things today. I want to identify many of the major mistakes, many of what I would also like to call the feigned mistakes or the feigned confusion that we're seeing in the lower courts. And then I want to explain the proper way to address some of these issues. So the key is, of course, you have to understand when you approach the Second Amendment as a subject matter, that like it was once taught that Gaul is divided into three parts. The Second Amendment today is divided into two parts. The first part, or the first bucket, if you will, are arms ban cases. The second bucket, or the second part, if you will, are non-arms ban cases. Now this distinction I'm making is not trivial in any respect. It is extremely important that people interested in the fundamental right to keep and bear arms get this distinction correct. Because if you fail to draw this distinction in the context of arms ban cases, you will be led down a very bad, a very expensive, a very time consuming, and a totally unnecessary rabbit hole. This is because you will allow the anti-gun lobby in this country to essentially relitigate the historical analog portion of the Heller Bruin test of text first, burden shifts to the government, and then government has to do the history. Now instead, when you're dealing with arms ban cases, you simply have to apply the legal principle set forth in Heller, and that's the key. Now, 
before we get to that test and how you apply it, which is really very simple, we have to understand and debunk one myth. That myth that you see in the press, and I spent a lot of time in and around the media, is that the Bruin decision in 2022 was groundbreaking. The Bruin decision in 2022 was not groundbreaking at all. It was simply a reiteration and a reaffirmation of the Supreme Court's 2008 originalist decision in the District of Columbia versus Heller. That's all it was. In fact, to prove the point, let us quote the U.S. Supreme Court and Justice Thomas himself in Bruin. Quote, the test that we set forth in Heller and apply today. I repeat, Bruin said, quote, the test that we set forth in Heller and apply today requires courts to assess whether modern firearms regulations are consistent with the Second Amendment's text and historical understanding. So the Supreme Court itself in Bruin is literally telling us we are simply applying in Bruin Heller. So there's nothing groundbreaking about Bruin. But then you might ask, well, what was Bruin all about? Why did they spend all of this time uh, going into all of these issues? Well, there's a couple reasons for why they did this. And again, a lot of it speaks to the mistakes, quote unquote mistakes, if you will, that occurred between the year of our Lord 2008, which is Heller, and 2022, which is Bruin. So the first thing that, that Bruin did was to fix mistakes. And the major mistake that Bruin did, after it points out they're applying just a Heller methodology of text first, burden shifting to the government, historical analog analysis, is they wanted to fix once and for all, which never needed to be fixed because Heller was pretty clear on this, but they wanted to fix once and for all there would be no more interest balancing tests, no more tiers of scrutiny, no more strict scrutiny, none of those barnacles that are stuck upon our jurisprudence involving things like the First Amendment. So they made clear no more interest balancing, and again, this was entirely unnecessary and only brought about in Bruin because of the quote-unquote inferior courts, not all of them, of course, but some of them getting them totally wrong. For any doubt about this, one only needs to look at the language that Justice Scalia used in Heller on this question of interest balancing. This is what Heller said in 2008, quote, we know of no other enumerated constitutional right whose core protection has been subjected to a freestanding interest balancing approach. The very enumeration of the right takes out of the hands of government, including the third branch of government, the courts, the power to decide on a case-by-case -case basis whether the right is really worth insisting upon, a constitutional guarantee subject to future judges' assessments of its usefulness is no constitutional guarantee at all. That powerful language was not in 2022 in Bruin, it was in 2008 in Heller. So he clearly as we stand here today, Heller remains good law and should be followed, in particular in the case and the types of cases that Heller decided which are arms ban cases. Now, now that we clearly understand that Heller is the binding definitive law, okay, which a lot of people want to pretend it's not, and you'll see why in a second, we have to say what did Heller decide and why do we care today? Well, we know what Heller decided because in Heller, the court was asked to whether or not the handgun ban of the District of Columbia was constitutional under the Second Amendment. And just as a strong originalist court should do in trying to search for the original public meaning of the constitutional provision, it started with the best historical evidence of them all as to what something means. It's called the text of the Constitution itself. Mind you, remember, when we talk about history, the Constitution itself is history, and probably the dispositive history on many issues, and the text speaks for itself. Never lose sight of that, because, of course, the anti-gun community, as I see it, doesn't like the text of the Second Amendment for obvious reasons. So with that said, we turn to what Heller said about arms bans. It starts quite simply by defining its terms. And the key term in Heller was, what do arms mean? And they very simply said, quoting you know, English lexicographers like Samuel Johnson and the like, simply said that arms can be anything that can be used offensively or defensively. 
And then it went on to confirm by looking at history to say, yeah, that, that all makes sense. It looked at history going back from England all the way to the post-Civil War era and said, are there any historical analog laws? Now that we know the text says that an arm is anything that can be used offensively or defensively, is there any, any historical analog laws at the time of the founding or otherwise that could give rise to justifying the DC handgun ban? Well, the only thing they uncovered was a law that says there is a, quote, historical tradition of prohibiting the carrying of dangerous and, conjunctive, dangerous and unusual weapons. And in light of this history, right, they did the historical work, there's a historical basis for saying you can ban the carrying of dangerous and unusual weapons, and in light of that, the court said, well, in light of this, this means, by definition, that if an arm is in common use by Americans for lawful purposes today, it cannot be banned because under the historical tradition, only dangerous and unusual weapons can be banned. If a weapon is in common use by Americans, it obviously cannot be unusual and because it cannot be unusual, it cannot possibly meet the historical tradition standard of firearms regulation known as dangerous and unusual. So that was the legal principle, the legal test set forth, that if you're dealing with an arms ban case, because DC was an arms ban case in the forms of handgun bans case, you apply the historical standard of dangerous and unusual, and when guns, and of course, everything we're talking about in today's court system are obviously in common use, AR-15s, magazines that hold more than 10 rounds, suppressors and the like, there's millions of these things, they cannot be banned. And mind you one other thing, as to who gets to decide what are the weapons that are protected under the Second Amendment's the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, the Supreme Court answered that question as well. And the answer is, we, the people, get to decide what arms are protected. You don't have to take my word for it. Why don't we turn to the Supreme Court again in Heller? The Supreme Court, in po pointing out that the handgun ban was unconstitutional, wrote the following, quote, whatever the reason, whatever the reason, whatever the reason, handguns are the most popular weapon chosen by Americans for self-defense in the home, and a complete prohibition on their use is invalid. Doesn't matter what the reason is. We the people choose. And if it's in common use and we're, we, we have these guns, they're protected. Now, I also want to make a note that guess who else agrees with me? You may find this hard to believe, but the Solicitor General under Joe Biden's administration agrees with Mark Smith. I don't often say that, but I will today and I will then prove it with a statement that the Solicitor General made at the Rahimi oral argument this week. She says that, quote, once you have the principle locked in, then I do not think it's necessary to effectively repeat that same historical, that same historical and logical analysis for the purposes of determining whether or not a modern day legislature's disarmament provision fits within the category. The point is that even the Solicitor General, when talking about the history, remember there's the text first, then you shift to the burden to the government to do the history. The burden's on the government to do the history. When they're doing the history, even the Solicitor General of Joe Biden says, once the history has been done by a court, and the Supreme Court has done the history, and has come up with the legal test, or the legal principle that arises or derives from that historical spade work, that's it. That is the test you apply, and that concept applies 150% to the fact that Heller came up with the legal test or the legal principle to apply in all arms ban cases in the United States. But now let us ask in light of this, what have the lower courts done with this very basic analysis that a first year law student could nail in an exam in December of his first semester? Well, unfortunately the lower courts seem to make this more complicated than it needs to be. One wonders why that's happening in some of these courts. Well, the, the first things we're starting to see, of course, and of course, these cases usually involve two things. We'll talk mostly about two things. 
AR-15s, which are nothing more than semi-automatic rifles, right? So let's just step back for a moment. In Heller, they said modern firearms are protected. Modern firearms consist, at least in the handgun context of Heller, revolvers and semi-automatic pistols, okay? They're responsible for maybe, I don't, I don't know what the number is, but you know, something like this, 10,000 deaths a year in the United States or whatever associated with homicides. In contrast, we're now litigating over semi-automatic rifles, which are the exact same firearm as semi-automatic pistols protected by, Bruin, uh, by Heller, except they're rifles, and they're only responsible for like 300 deaths a year of all long guns. Now, I'm not you know, saying that that's, not a, a, that's a good thing or anything, but the point is it would seem to me that the long guns, the, the semi-automatic rifle case is much easier, but for some reason, reason, um, these blue state courts don't seem to agree. So let us go through the mistakes that the little courts are making with respect to this. The first thing is they are pretending that Heller is not the law and they're using this opportunity to relitigate again these gun ban cases from uh, scratch. And again, uh, rather than applying the in common use test, they come up with new tests. Because once you pretend that Heller is no longer good law, and this is why I'm dwelling on this here, once you are in an arms ban litigation today in America and you, know, and you don't apply Heller because you pretend it's not binding on you as an inferior court judge, you then have free will and free hand to make stuff up. And that is why we are seeing these gun bans of AR-15s and semi-automatic rifles getting banned under such new legal tests invented by certain lower courts, and these are some of the legal tests that have come up, that you can ban these arms because they are, quote, exceptionally dangerous, they are particularly dangerous, or they are assault weapons, and so on and so on. Again, these are all effectively a form of interest balancing test that you're not allowed to use as per Heller and, of course, Bruin, but that's exactly what's going on. But the good news is some courts do get this right. In a footnote this week in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals Vanderstock case, they laid it out beautifully a few days ago. This is what the Fifth Circuit wrote, quote, the Supreme Court has held that to be banned, a weapon must be both dangerous and unusual, and thus the relative dangerousness of a weapon is irrelevant when the weapon belongs to a class of arms commonly used for lawful purposes, citing to the Justice Alito dissent in Caetano, and of course, the Fifth Circuit went on to say, of course, for many years now, millions of AR-15 rifles have been sold to civilians who may lawfully possess them. Now, I should also note that um, this is, I think, where the biggest game gets played. And you have to be extremely careful with what I'm about to say. And it's very easy to defeat if you know what's coming. Because I've seen in many briefs involving gun control cases, um, a sentence from Bruin gets cut in half. And you'll see why it gets cut in half in one second. Specifically, what we're seeing is a lot of the lower courts are using a phrase or an argument that says, unprecedented societal and technological change allows them as an excuse to make things up and get around Heller and get around Bruin and again, invent new legal tests that all of which convince, conveniently seem to uphold gun bans. Specifically, the language that they are using from Bruin is this, quote, while the historical analogies here and in Heller, in Heller, while the historical analogies here and in Heller are relatively simple to draw, other cases, other cases implicating unprecedented societal concerns or dramatic technological changes may require a more nuanced approach. You see there? The sentence starts off with talking about Heller, and then it talks about other cases implicating unprecedented societal concerns or dramatic technological changes. So, of course, what happens is that a lot of these lower courts conveniently cut off the opening clause of that sentence from Bruin and simply mouth the words, hey, if we have unprecedented societal concerns or unprecedented or dramatic technological change, we get to make it up as we go along. We get to ignore Hiller and simply say, oh, well, these are dangerous, I don't like them, you lose. No, that's not how it works, because it turns out that the language of that sentence itself prevents that. Because again, it starts off that while historical analog analogies here and in Heller 
are relatively simple to draw other cases. So this sentence is talking about other cases, other cases from Heller, which is the arms ban case that sets forth the legal test to govern arms ban cases. Nevertheless, that is a game that we see played over and over and over again. And mind you, just to be extra clear, that any suggestion that either an AR-15 semi-automatic rifle or mass shootings would be considered to be either an unprecedented societal concern or a dramatic technological change is not just defeated by the fact that the first clause of that sentence says Heller controls, okay? It's also defeated by the text, of course, but moreover, Heller came out in the year of our Lord 2008. What happened in the year of our Lord 2007? 2007, we saw one of the worst mass shootings in American history at Virginia Tech, where a student using a semi-automatic handguns and magazines that held more than 10 rounds killed something like 30 people, unfortunately, at Virginia Tech in 2007. In 2008, this point was made in amicus briefs to the U.S. Supreme Court in the Heller case itself. So the Supreme Court was aware of semi-automatic firearms. They were aware of magazines that held more than 10 rounds. And they were aware of mass shootings in 2007 when they decided the Heller case in 2008. Moreover, because the dangerous and unusual test gives rise to sort of the back end, the in common use test, which as you know applies to modern, the modern world, we're not limited to muskets as the Supreme Court has repeatedly said. The in common use test by Americans for lawful purposes, but implicitly within its test, articulated by the Supreme Court in Heller, in, implicates and encompasses any such social change, societal change, or technology that exists today. Because the question is, what do we, the people, decide we need today? And any societal change involving arms bans or any technological changes involving arms bans, again, is encompassed in that test. And mind you, don't forget, we had mass shootings at the time of the founding. I won't list all of them, but the simplest one, of course, is the Boston Massacre in 1770, where eight Americans were killed by British soldiers, and they were tried, with John Adams successfully defending, by and large, the officers there. So mass shootings existed before even the Constitution. So the next error we see by the lower courts involving these arms ban cases, of course, they try to argue. Because once you get away from the Heller in common use test, you get to make it up. And next thing you know, you see some of these courts uh, embracing arguments made by the anti-gun lobby to say things like, oh, well, you know, these AR-15 semi-automatic rifles, magazines that hold more than 10 rounds, uh, these are not commonly used for self-defense. See that little sleight of hand? So we go from Heller it says, in common use by Americans for lawful purposes, as a, as, the, as a legal test. And now it's, and by the way, the Solicitor General made this exact point in Rahimi. She said, that, oh, well, you know, uh, weapons that are in common use by Americans, uh, you know, and used for self-defense, commonly used for self-defense. This is where they're trying to make that shift. And again, this is why it's so important to understand that the Heller test is the law, because there's an attempt to rewrite Heller and make stuff up to get around that binding precedent. And again, one of the popular ones we see over and over and over again, including by this Department of Justice, is again, if an arm is not shown to be commonly used for self-defense, it cannot be protected. Now, of course, there are many reasons why this is a mistake. The first is that mere possession, mere possession of a handgun is using the gun. That gun on your nightstand when you go to bed that just sits there is in use for self-defense when you sleep. That gun in the holster of a police officer is in use just when it sits in the holster. If it's never pulled out and fired, it's still being used no different than a health insurance policy is being used even if you're not, you know, going to the doctor or a fire extinguisher is being used in the building, in this building itself, I'm sure, even though it's not being, you know, sprayed at anything. So the mere possession of a firearm in and of itself is a use, and thus the mere possession satisfies in common use. You don't have to do what the anti-gunners like to say, which is you got to show that it's commonly used for self-defense. We need to see that people use AR-15s like every day to pull the trigger and defend themselves, which of course does happen. We know that does happen. Um, the, the, and the, the next point, of course, <clears throat> that I want to mention here is, and this is important, 
that the Heller case was decided on a motion to dismiss. A motion to dismiss. The Supreme Court gave rise to the Heller case, the Heller decision. Now this is important because the Heller decision arose without the benefit of testimony, without the benefit of experts, without the benefit of a trial, and without the evidence being presented of how many times guns are used in self-defense or any of these things, because none of it mattered. None of it mattered. So the point being that for lower courts to pretend that Heller is not the binding law and to look for ways to redo the Heller debate by redoing the history and redoing the historical analog analysis in arms ban case, cases is totally unacceptable. And this is a huge deal because we see this all across the country in magazine cases and, and semi-automatic ban cases all across the country where they're simply not applying Heller. And once you apply Heller, of course, there's no way that the anti-gun lobby can win because there are millions and millions of magazines, ten, hundreds of millions of magazines and you know ten, tens of millions of AR-15s and they can't possibly uh, show that these things are not in common use. And one other thing, because the in common use, dangerous and unusual standard arises from the history part, the history part of the analysis, guess what? Where does the burden lie? With the government. So it's not that the Second Amendment community has to prove that an arm or a magazine is in common use. In fact, it's the opposite. Because this is part of the history portion of the text first, burn shifts to the government to do the history. Because it's part of the historical analysis part of the text and history methodology of interpreting the Second Amendment, the burden is actually on the government to demonstrate that an arm that they've banned is dangerous and unusual. And to do that, they have to prove, the government has to prove that these arms are not in common use, which is simply impossible because they've all gone on the record a thousand times that we have too many AR-15s and too many magazines in the country. So they can't possibly even argue it, and they don't. And that's why it's all about them trying to redefine the legal test, the legal standard that was set forth by the Supreme Court in Heller, which remains good law. <clears throat> So I, so I now want to turn just briefly to magazines because there's some confusion about magazines specifically. Magazines, as you know, is the device, and sometimes they're fixed and sometimes they're not fixed, that are inserted into a firearm that allow a firearm to be shot multiple times without having to manually reload it. We see magazine bans of magazines that hold more than 10 rounds all across the country. There's one simple reason why these things are clearly unconstitutional. Step back for a moment and ask yourself, what have you effectively done if you ban magazines that hold more than 10 rounds of ammunition? What you have done is you have banned an entire category, an entire class of firearms. Specifically, just like in DC in Heller, where they banned the entire class of firearms known as handguns, if you ban magazines that hold more than 10 rounds of ammunition, you have banned an entire class of firearms, i.e. firearms that are capable of firing more than 10 rounds without having to be manually reloaded. That entire category of firearms has been taken off the table and effectively banned. So when you hear the words, it's just a magazine ban, your first instinct should always be, no, this is an actual firearm ban of firearms that can hold and fire more than 10 rounds without having to manually reload. It is a firearms ban. But even going beyond that, of course, if you want to take it at a second level, magazines are essential components, integral components of modern day firearms of all semi-automatic firearms, including handguns that are protected arms specifically under the Heller precedent. So even if you wanted to go down that path, of course, uh, they would be protected. And last but not least, in terms of magazines, there's really only one argument historically, uh, or one possible historical analog that one could justify uh, banning uh, magazines. And you don't need to do this, remember, because Heller always gives you the legal test. So what I'm about to say is unnecessary. But you could just throw it in there because it's often argued by those that support gun control. And that is, they quote, the 18th, uh, the 18th century examples of black powder 
storage regulations. And they say, oh, well, at the time of the founding, you know, there were regulations that prevented the storing in cities or in homes of large quantities of black powder, and therefore that's, you know, that's like part of ammunition, therefore that's effectively a limitation on uh, ammunition in a sense. But no, that's not true because as David Thompson uh, articulately explained, the how and the why of a historical analog is not satisfied there. Because why did you have black powder regulation involving the storage of large quantities of black powder in the 18th century? And the answer is because entire cities like Boston and Philadelphia were made out of wood. And if, you call, and if this highly flammable black powder, which by the way is still regulated today as a highly flammable uh, substance, if this black powder, heaven forbid, ever caught fire, it literally would burn down entire cities. And that is not something that's impossible to imagine for our founding fathers because in the year 1666, the entire city of London burned down because of fire. So when they talk about in these gun control cases, the storage of black powder is an example of gun control. No, it was a fire regulation and under the Bruin test of how and why of regulations have to be met, the why of the regulation in that case was fire pre prevention, fire control, and not gun control or crime control. So the why cannot be used to satisfy you know, magazine capacity limitations. <clears throat> now I wanna turn briefly and talk about non-arms ban cases. All of what I've just talked about were really arms ban cases, and I spent time on it because it's very important. Because again, this is where we see the greatest amount of conf feigned confusion by pretending that the law that's binding on these lower courts does not exist. So to begin with, I wanna talk briefly about the textual analysis of the Second Amendment, and then I'll go back and talk about some of the historical analysis. It is important to understand when you're looking at Second Amendment cases that at the textual level, you have the text, which is the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. But you also have ancillary rights in the Second Amendment in the same way that you have ancillary or implied rights in other aspects of the Bill of Rights. So to give you an example, if you look at how two 18th century, early 19th century lexicographers define the word infringed, as we know, the right of the people to keep mirrors shall not be infringed. So let's take a look briefly at the definition of the word infringed in the 18th century. Well, Noah Webster and Samuel Johnson both said that to infringe is to hinder or destroy. Hinder or destroy. And I think there's three things that pop up that clearly are examples of modern day gun control laws that hinder and or destroy the right to keep and bear arms. First, and, and, but, and, but they're implied in the, in the context of the Second Amendment. One is the right to train with guns. You can't use guns effectively if you don't train with them. So anything involving restrictions on, let's say, gun ranges or the ability to train, I think is an infringement. You also have several cases dealing with the right to buy guns. For example, in the Fifth Circuit right now, you have a case called Reese versus ATF as to whether or not to 18 to 20 year olds are allowed to acquire guns. We'll talk about that in one second, but in terms of the right to buy guns, obviously the right to keep in arms presupposes that we acquire guns in some way. And of course, two of the obvious ways one can acquire guns is one can go out and buy guns, right? And there's restrictions on that. And then of course you can go out and make guns and the go out and make guns is a historical tradition in the United States, but also keep in mind, this speaks to the quote unquote ghost gun issue, which is really just a ban on do it yourself gun kits and the like to prevent Americans from being able to make their own guns. Again, these are examples of what I call ancillary rights um, that, that speak to this. Now there's two examples of other uh, I just want to mention how you see ancillary rights. First, in the First Amendment, we have other ancillary rights like the right to expressive association, the right to gather news, and the right to attend criminal trials. These are not expressly in the text, but they are still there. Likewise, the Sixth Amendment, you have a right to pay for your lawyer, even though it doesn't specifically say that. So now let's just talk briefly about history, and then I'll wrap up. Most important thing I want to talk about the history is that the relevant time period is 1791. The Second Amendment was adopted in 1791 with the rest of the Bill of Rights, so it's 1791 is the key year. The Supreme Court has repeatedly said that whether you apply the Bill of Rights to the states or to the federal government, it is to be interpreted the same. 
And because it's to be interpreted the same, you look to 1791, because that was when it was created. And the purpose of the 14th Amendment in 1868 was to take the 1791 understanding of the Second Amendment and to apply it to a new group of protectives, if you will, people protected by it, i.e. the freed African-American slaves, and it applied to a group, new group of government, i.e. Uh, states and localities. But it was the same 1791 understanding. And to prove the point, one need only look at the 2020 decision by the U.S. Supreme Court in Espinoza versus Montana, where an opinion by Chief Justice John Roberts dealing with pro public funding to religious schools uh, he talks about the role of 19th century historical precedent when he points out that in the late 19th century, there, there were 30 states. 30 states had adopted uh, really what were called no aid provisions, meaning you could not spend public money on religious institutions. This was motivated mostly by anti-Catholic bigotry. In this context, Justice Roberts got it right. He says that I don't care that 30 states adopted uh, something that violates the 1791 First Amendment because that's too late in time. And then when he was criticized by Justice Sotomayor for having a double standard, he came back and says, no, you don't understand. Late 19th century evidence can be used to confirm the 1791 understanding, but late 19th century evidence cannot be used to contradict the 1791 understanding. And there's no more powerful evidence of this than the 30 statewide laws that the Supreme Court rejected in the Espinoza case. So again, I think it's 1791. So anyway, uh, I'm available for questions, obviously, and I will just sum up this way. I've spent a lot of time this morning talking about the lower courts, but I want to say something about the Supreme Court. If you look at the statistics of the number of cases taken by the U.S. Supreme Court going back several decades, guess what? There were periods in time where there were over 300 cases taken. I understand there were some rule changes, but even in more recent times, we've seen cases, uh, uh, case dockets of the U.S. Supreme Court of upwards of 150 and so on. And now we're seeing a trend towards 60, 70 cases a term. And I would, in addition to encouraging lower courts uh, to get it right on the Second Amendment, I would also encourage the U.S. Supreme Court to take more Second Amendment cases to clear up some of this feigned confusion we're seeing in the inferior courts. And I hope that the start with Rahimi and hopefully uh, with the range case and more, I hope that's a trend we will see more of and I hope it will be favorable and I think it will, but I think the Supreme Court itself should be doing more work in the Second Amendment area. It is not unusual to see the Supreme Court take multiple Fourth Amendment cases or First Amendment cases in a term. Why not multiple Second Amendment cases in a term as well? Thank you. Thank you, Mark, thank you, Mark and thank you, David. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead. I want to make sure we have enough time for questions. I want to ask a question that uh, I guess is a sort of a little bit of a technical question. What you, what you see, especially if you listen to the oral argument at Rahimi, is you see, um, you see the, the, the government's argument seems to be, let's look at the history. From the history, let's extract a principle. The principle in the Rahimi case they're saying is dangerousness, responsibility. And then what they're saying is they take that, they take that principle and they say, um, we don't need to have, really what they're saying, we don't need to have a very direct analogy. We just need to have, take that principle of dangerousness, say, is what the state or the federal government is doing trying to protect against people being dangerous? And then there you have it. You, uh, you, you've got your analogy. You, and the problem with that, obviously, is that um, that's a very flexible standard and seems to be uh, somewhat inconsistent with um, what at least people thought Bruin meant when it first came out because uh, everybody knows pretty quickly after law school that if you can extract a principle, depending on how generalized the principle is, if the principle is just how, you know, we want to make the world a better place and that's what this law is trying to do and that's what the founders are trying to do and so there's a match. Um, on the other hand, I mean, there is the language in Bruin that it doesn't have to be a, a exact match and such. So what can we do to try to um, constrain courts to where they are getting the match at the right level of generality, I guess is a question about it. Yes, I mean, so I think that is one of the problems is the lack of... Uh, the 
that it's at too high a level of generality, uh, number one. But number two, it's sort of jettisoning the whole, the, the how part. It's focusing just on the why, the purpose. Dangerous people, we don't want them to have firearms, but not, you know, the, the uh, anti-gun community just wants to blind itself to how. And that is one of the two parts of the Bruin test, and it's really important. We can see in the analogs that they point to in Rahimi, they're really falling short on the how, uh, because an affray was a criminal violation, and you got the full panoply of protections from criminal law before you were disarmed. And likewise, with a surety, it was a very different system where members of the community could come forward and vouch for you. And so they're just sort of throwing that away uh, and, and, and skipping over uh, and, and trying to impermissibly sweep in more analogs. But Mark, do you have a... Yeah, okay. Well, it looks like we have a bunch of folks lined up, so I think I'm just going to go ahead and we have about... Uh, 15, 20 minutes left. So I'm gonna go ahead and start uh, taking questions if that's, if that's all right uh, with my panelists. I'll come up here. So I will remind you in uh, Federal Society National Convention tradition, you should not ask a question. You should uh, just state your views and then put a question mark <laughs> at the end of it. Um, <clears throat> no, I think, it's, I think it's the other way around. <laughs> They're here to state their views. You're here to ask a question. And I will endeavor to um, ask questions at both microphones because I've seen that be missed a few times, but I'll start here in the front. Um, try to keep it a little bit short since we're short on time. Sure, thank you so much. Brilliant panel. I have a question about uh, the barnacles. So, Judge, you touched on, on the, um, can the you, analogy Can you get a little bit issue. closer to the microphone? Oh, sorry. Judge, you touched on the analogy issue, um, but as much as I think strict scrutiny and the tiers aren't popular here, isn't there an issue where at least we could have some concept in addition to everything we have with Brune and Heller an issue of uh, tailoring, because many of these laws, they just don't even make any sense at all, and they have never managed to produce any logical or statistical basis that gun control makes people safer or it stops mass shootings. The vast majority of mass shootings happen in gun-free zones, as we know, for obvious reasons. Um, will there be any, any clarification or slight modification to add another level where they also have to, have to at least meet some kind of um, rationality test in addition to just I'm concerned pl just playing the analogy game and stretching it as much as they can. No, it's really a test that uh, trusts the founders, that if they had a system that they put in place, um, even if we might think today, well, you know, it's not really that well tailored, uh, then that doesn't matter. Tailoring is gone. Uh, for whatever reasons, the founders had a shorty system. It was okay then, and it's okay now. Uh, so I don't think we're gonna see a resuscitation of uh, the tailoring concept. For those of you who haven't read uh, this law review article by my colleagues, John Ollendorf and Joel Alisea, it is a fantastic takedown of the tiers of scrutiny. Uh, Mark was quoting Chief Justice Roberts from the Heller decision calling them a barnacle. They're a lot worse than a barnacle. Uh, it is a judge empowering test to chip away and erode the protections and the rights that the founders gave us. And then for judges to say, yeah, well, we know it says Congress shall pass no law abridging the freedom of speech, but we think this is really important. So, you know, we're going to say you can't Oh, for example, say the name of a candidate in the 60 days before general election, which was the issue in the McCain-Feingold case, okay? So, you know, it's very pernicious, and I think uh, the conservatives have driven a stake through tiers of scrutiny in the Second Amendment, we're not going to see it come back. Yeah, let me ask a, let me ask a follow-up to that real quick, because it's true, you know, tailoring's supposed to be off the table because entrance balancing's supposed to be off the table, but if you listen to the Rahimi argument, and if the idea is that you're extracting some principle and then you're deciding whether or not the legislature is essentially just trying to effectuate the same principle, and of course you have the general, I, mean, I don't know how you, how would you get away from some sort of fit concept because if the idea is dangerousness but the legislature says, well, this group of people is dangerous but only some, set of that, some subset of that group is dangerous, I mean, how would you get away from having some sort of tailoring analysis, sneaking back in at that level if that's what you're going to do. That, that's well, one of the questions. Well, you do have to look and see whether it's, uh, you know, uh, distinctly similar. Uh, and so there, th th in that level, yes, okay, you're making a comparison, which I guess with tailoring, you're making a comparison of, you know, does this sweep too broadly? And, and likewise, when you're looking at whether something Meets, meets the how part of the test, you have to see, is it distinctly similar? So you're making a comparison, but I think it really does 
cabin the discretion of judges not to allow them to say, well, this is really important. So even though it says the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, we think there's a real, you know, a problem with X, Y, or Z, so we're going to clamp down on that. So you're not just focused on um, the problem that they're trying to address, but how is it that they tried to address that problem? Yeah, that's right. All right. All right, I'll go to the back, back there. Well, Cam Atkinson from Connecticut. Um, uh, Attorney Thompson said um, that, if I recollect correctly earlier, he said bad facts make bad law. Um, and my question regarding Rahimi is obviously is there, there's bad facts there, but do you see Rahimi as being ref is going to be reflective of a larger trend when the Supreme Court is confronted with scary facts? Um, for instance, uh, the Negrelli case out of New York arguing for um, guns in private schools. Um, the, the argument could be made under the Bruen methodology that pistol permits themselves have no historical support. Do you see Rahimi as turning into something broader of a pushback on scary facts, just not bad facts? No, I think it was a savvy uh, strategic maneuver by Merrick Garland. Here he's got this terrible set of facts, uh, and so he rushes it to the Supreme Court uh, in the hopes that uh, the, 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 uh, the bad facts will make bad case law. I, I was um, hardened by the fact that the justices really seemed to uh, be looking at uh, and, and disregarding the various ways in which the Solicitor General was trying to really weaken the Bruin methodology. Um, and so I don't think it's actually going to be that bad a decision. I think it'll be a narrow decision that focuses on the fact that Rahimi basically agreed that he was a dangerous person. He signed on to the protective order saying that he had done all these terrible things and that would have been enough at the time of the founding. All right, we'll come to the front here. Thank you, Paul, Paul Krauss from Oakland. Um, could the panel comment on place-based or situation-based restrictions such as what has been happening recently in New Mexico? Yes, so this is another very important, maybe, you know, the armbands are super important, but another super important fight that's going on is where can you carry? And uh, the uh, court in Bruin acknowledged that there were sensitive places at the time of the founding, and those included courthouses, those included polling places, and it included schools. And so, the, to, uh, I'll get to schools in, in a second, but, um, and so the, the, the left is trying to say, well, look, you know, we've got all these places, uh, that are very sensitive. And first of all, we know that's not true because they were never sensitive until Bruin came along and then they magically became sensitive uh, after the fact, number one. Number two, you know, if we properly apply Bruin, we look at something like uh, the courthouses. And at the time of the founding, courthouses had comprehensive security. By that I mean every entry point had an armed guard, a bailiff, a sergeant at arms, and so your need for self-defense was reduced. You know, going back to the purpose of the second, or one of the purposes of the Second Amendment, the need for self-defense. And so uh, that's why at a courthouse at the time of the founding, uh, there were bans on carriage. Likewise, in schools were not gun-free zones at the time of the founding. It's true that starting in 1655, Harvard said that students couldn't carry guns, and Yale and others followed suit uh, shortly thereafter, but um, that was students. Teachers were always permitted uh, to carry firearms, and the rationale had nothing to do with comprehensive security. There wasn't. Uh, it was that the schools were acting in loco parentis for the students, and so they therefore had the authority to tell them what they could carry and what they couldn't. And so um, those sensitive places, um, you know, if you take those principles, the principle of comprehensive security, and you bring it to the 21st century, look at a place like TSA. There's comprehensive security. So they can say you can't carry a firearm beyond uh, the, the uh, security checkpoint because they are providing the defense uh, to keep people safe. So uh, that's going to be a big fight, and it's something that's playing out, and it'll probably hit the Supreme Court next term, maybe the term after that. I want to add one thing to that, uh, which is 
As we know from Supreme Court precedent, uh, the government has no legal duty to protect you from criminals. The only exception to that is if you are in government custody. If they put you in the back of a patrol car or they put you in prison, they take over the obligation to protect you. But absent being in custody, the notion of to serve and protect is simply a model and not legally meaningful. I mention this in the context of the sensitive, in sensitive places is a euphemism for government mandated gun free zones. The way I see this issue and why I think comprehensive security makes sense is if the government is willing to put their money where their mouth is and said, we will protect you. We will spend the money on metal detectors. We will spend the money on armed guards to protect you and effectively take you in, under our wing and protect you, then you don't need to have guns here because we're going to step up and do it for you. But anything short of that that doesn't really shift the burden to the government to basically say, we're adopting you for this limited period of time while you're in our custody in a sense, uh, yeah, then it's all fake. So you sometimes hear these theories like, well, it involves core governmental functions, that's utterly unworkable. That's absurd. What is a core governmental function? You think the blue states manipulate the Second Amendment law now? Wait till you see when they start talking about that core governmental functions is, is protecting wetlands. It's protecting the post office, right? It's, it's, it's educating kids. It's like a whole, there's no end to what might be a core governmental function. And that's why the way to understand, and if you look at the three examples cited in Bruin of sensitive places, they're courthouses protected by bailiffs. They're legislative chambers protected by historically sergeants at arm and their polling place is protected by a combination of sheriffs and constables all during the founding the one thing that makes that common the one common thread there is comprehensive security that the government is providing people with guns to protect the citizens there and in that case they're taking over your armed protection but absent that you're on your own, you are your own first responder, and if you want to have a gun to protect yourself and your family, under the Second Amendment, you're entitled to it. And, and the other uh, thing that's common to those uh, places is that you're there for a finite period of time. They couldn't say, well, this city where you live is now a gun-free zone because we're going to have you know, Chinese-style totalitarian uh, security uh, around the city. That would not work. But if you're going to court, it's for a finite period of time. You're flying on the plane, it's a finite period of time. And so that's another limiting principle. Yeah, and I, I think I would add to that. Coaches. Oh, Not, yes, no, th this is a very, I, I don't want to let anyone cut the line, but it's an important point, uh, <laughs> which is churches. Um, and so at the time of the founding, uh, churches were sensitive, okay, in the sense of people knew they were a vulnerable uh, spot because everyone went, and so there was nobody at home uh, back then. And so what did the founders do? They required you to bring a gun to church, okay? Uh, and so even the state of New York, when we sued them and got a PI, sort of backed off. It was like, okay, well, we'll. so it's now, I think, only Montgomery County is maybe the only place in America where you can't bring a gun to your synagogue or your church to protect yourself, but uh, most of the blue states have, have backed off on that. Yeah, and something I, I just wanted to add is, as a practical, and I, I haven't heard much talk about this, but as a practical matter, one of the, one of the sort of problems with a sensitive area is uh, even the legitimate ones, is it actually often practically prevents people from being able to carry generally. So like if, if, some, if your company you worked at said you can't carry, which is, you know, they may or may not be allowed to do, that's going to prevent you from being able to um, carry most of the time because when you drive to your company, if they won't let you park, and, and if, you can't, if you couldn't carry at church, you also aren't going to be carrying after church when you go out to eat and such. So the, I think a lot of times it get lo gets lost as a practical, you know, when I when I lived in Virginia but worked in D.C. and you couldn't bring a handgun into D.C., it meant that you couldn't have a, a, a firearm in your vehicle, even though it was legal to do so in Virginia. You couldn't because, you know, you're, you're, you're driving from Virginia into D.C. And so they sort of, I don't know what you'd call it, but the sort of the, these things reach beyond the, the actual area where they're, where they're. Well, and Justice Alito made that point in decimating the New York Solicitor General in Bruin when the, she was suggesting that, well, we can't have guns in subways. And he's like, what are the janitors supposed to do who have to walk through a dangerous neighborhood after cleaning the law, you know, big law office at three in the morning? If you don't let them have a, a firearm on the subway, you've effectively disarmed them. Yes, yes yeah, precisely. All right. There's a lot of agreement up here on that point. <laughs> but I'm just a neutral moderator. Uh, in, the, in the back. 
Several panelists throughout this weekend have raised concern about the workability of the historical analysis in Bruin, partially due to resource constraints in the lower courts. So first question is, do you think that's unworkable? And related to that, are challengers well advised, even though they do not have the burden to show the historical record, are they well advised to pre-argue and present the historical record so that the courts have a, uh, a well-rounded historical record to go off of? I think the concerns are academic nonsense. Okay, that's the nicest thing I can say. I think it is a highly workable test. It is the best test, sort of like Churchill, the best democracy is the worst system other than all the rest, okay? So it's a very uh, good test. It's a workable test. Uh, the, you know, uh, I'm, not, I'm not worried about the resources of, of the judiciary to uh, be able to look at these uh, statutes. And you know, sure, as a litigator, you want to answer, even if it's not our burden, Sure, if we have affirmative good historical evidence, we will absolutely put that forward. But as Mark was suggesting, you certainly don't need to have a historian. The other side wants to turn this into a battle of the experts. Look how many left-wing academics we can bring into court who will prostitute themselves uh, with a you know fanciful version of history. And that's the, in Bruin, there were zero experts. In Heller, there were zero experts. In Moore versus Madigan, there were zero experts. And in all of those cases, it was on a motion to dismiss, and summary judgment was granted by the appellate court. That's something I hope that all the appellate judges understand, because it's a little unusual if we're being honest with ourselves, but it, it makes perfect sense of if you're looking at the, st the historical statutes, just go ahead and decide it. Why are you remanding it back? They didn't do that in Heller Bruin, and Judge Posner didn't do that either. And I just want to say, you know, it's up to the parties to do the historical work. First of all, we're not talking about ancient Rome here. We're talking about the founding of this country, one of the, you know, the parts of world history that has been studied the most. It's only a couple hundred years ago. The law is then there. It's been studied for 200 plus years. Uh, I don't think there's a lot of hidden meaning and all that. And the parties have to bring, you know, the Supreme Court said it's up to the parties. And in the context of the Second Amendment, I can assure you there is no lack of resources on behalf of the billionaire funded anti-gun lobby. What they're whining about, and they are entitled to cheese where they're wine, perhaps. What they're whining about is the fact that when they go back to 1791, it turns out that the text of the Second Amendment, which is now, you know, the right of the people shall not be, the right of, the, you know, bear arms shall not be infringed, is that the text is corroborated by the lack of gun controls at the time, which makes a lot of sense if you think about it. Why would you have a foundational Second Amendment in the Constitution itself and yet have a lot of gun controls? It doesn't make sense because it was viewed as a right. And keep in mind that if we were having a conversation about the burden of proof in a criminal case where a person is presumed innocent and sits there and doesn't have to do anything and the entire burden is on the government to prove that someone committed a crime, we would not be crying about anything, right? That's the burden of the government. In this case, it's the same way. You have a clear text. If it applies to a gun control law, the burden shifts to the government just like it does in a criminal case and tell them to prove it. And if they can't prove it, they lose. And as the Bruin Court said in a footnote, I think it's footnote 14, where they're talking about the statute of Northampton and the Sir John Knight's case, they basically say that if there's a historical ambiguity in the historical record, the presumption is in favor of freedom. The presumption is in favor of the unqualified command of the text of the Second Amendment. So again, if the government can't come forth and prove its history, it's probably because there is no history of gun control in America because we fought a revolution over it at Lexington Green and, Mo and, and, and beyond. Well, and, and in Bruin too, you know, that's where we were able to show, even though it wasn't our burden, we were able to point to the fact that um, George Washington frequently traveled and carried with firearms, that John Adams brought a gun to school every day, uh, that Thomas Jefferson wrote his 15-year-old nephew, let your gun be your constant companion, you know, and we went through and through. And so it wasn't our burden to do that, but it just seemed prudent, you know, like, okay, it's not our burden, but the evidence all goes our way. Let's dump it on them and make the rubble bounce. All right. Well, um, we are at the end here. I don't want to uh, cut in our lunch time. Uh, so thank you very much to our panelists. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.